Three months ago, I started training for my first ever national FPV drone race, and thanks to my luck, my goggles at the time decided to stop working entirely. Now, because I'd only booked plane tickets, paid for accommodation, and built a new drone, I was about $2,000 deep into this commitment, so I needed to find a solution that wouldn't wreck my bank account even more. And that's when I found these things. So in today's video, I'll be showing you my on-track experience with HD Zero, if they're worth the price, and more importantly, did they help me win? It's all down to Brody Reed, the last man standing. But before we do that, you need to understand these five essential factors that make a pair of FPV goggles actually worth buying in the first place. First up, we're not on the era of grainy black and white TV anymore, so a top-notch pair of goggles needs to offer an HD view, giving you the clarity that you deserve. Think of the quality needing to be like a Samsung QLED TV, not your grandma's retro one. Next, if you're gonna have these on every time you take to the skies, then they better damn well feel like a second skin. They should be comfortable, durable, and light enough that you almost forget that they're there. Thirdly, it's not all about you looking good in them. Although, personally, I'd hate to wear something that makes me look even more silly than I already do. But anyways, back on topic, a good pair of goggles should provide a sharp, pixel-perfect views utilizing adjustable diopters and top quality screens to do so. If we don't have these things, your view is gonna look like a useless blurry mess and you're just gonna be looking like this for no reason at all. Fourth, the goggles should have a solid standing in the community. This means wide adoption and a reputation for being reliable. Like, if people are using them, but they're failing on them, that's not gonna be worth relying on for yourself, right? Now, I do wanna note here too that it's not just about being trendy, it's actually making sure that they'll be supported and improved upon in the long run. And finally, while I'm certain that we all love high-end gear and the amazing quality that is on offer to us, it shouldn't leave our wallets empty. The price of the goggles, along with the cost of compatible parts like VTXs and cameras, should be reasonable without compromising on said quality. Okay, so now you know what expectations I had going into the $600 purchase, Here's how things actually played out when the goggles arrived at my doorstep. I did what any normal person would do and excitedly unboxed my new gap, then started putting everything together to you know, get the goggles ready for their first use. While doing that, I snapped one of the plastic face plates by trying to swap it over, accidentally peeled the foam back a bit and found out that I needed to purchase my own antennas which would cost me a further $100. Interesting experience to say the least, and it really wasn't a great start for me, leaving a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. But I continued on. I mean, I really didn't have a choice. It was either these goggles were gonna work for me, or I wouldn't be racing at the NZO event in 40 days time. So over the next few weeks, I came across three things I flip and love about these goggles, and also three things that need to be improved on. Improved is a key word there though, and I'll explain why shortly. As mentioned earlier, I truly believe that if you're buying a new pair of goggles, you need to make sure they're future-proof with an HD system. I've come from using a mix of DJI Air units, so HD goggles, and also a fully analog setup too. Analog has the issue of looking like hot trash, and DJI has multiple issues starting with their ecosystem and the fact that they pretty much wipe out nearly every other video system around. Now, these goggles, however, come in with a new HD system that plays nicely with other video systems, doesn't lock you into an ecosystem by offering an analog module, and delivers low latency, solid looking HD video. They're just about the perfect mix of both worlds, offering a solution for nearly every pilot. The second thing was actually something that I was a little bit worried about prior to buying though. With my last pair of analog converter goggles, these things, I found that I'd always have them flailing around, weighing my face down, and becoming pretty damn uncomfortable after 10 minutes or so. From what I could see, the HD Zero goggles still looked pretty beefy and heavy, but thankfully to my delight, it turns out these are some of the more comfortable goggles I now own. Although in saying that, the DJI goggles too still take the crown for being the comfiest. Now before we get to that third thing that I love more than a gnome loves a garden party on a cruise ship, we need to talk about the improvement side of things, just so you can understand it all a little better. Being a first generation goggle, I definitely expected it to have some flaws, and so I'm not surprised to confirm that it indeed does. One of which though, could stop you from using the goggles entirely until you fix it. Firstly for me, I found that I actually had a separate issue in regards to the analog module. Little did I know that by having this little module in, I was draining my battery ridiculously fast, resulting in me not being able to get much more than an hour out of a 3000 milliamp hour pack. Yeah, not good, right? After removing the module though, the battery drain lessened a whole lot. I mean, it's still pretty bad and I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's efficient or anything. It's just a power hungry pair of goggles. Secondly, this is an issue that affects racers all the time. I've watched racers sit down on their seat, drone ready to go on the track, and then they find out that they forgot to turn their HD Zero goggles on. 
For most goggles, this would be all good and they would be ready in 10 seconds max, but with HD Zero, boy oh boy, not so much. After flicking the on switch, these things take a leisurely 20 to 30 seconds to start up. That's 20 more seconds that other people are waiting on you, 20 more seconds that everyone's drones are sitting in the sun, and 20 more seconds of nervous waiting. Now, circling back to that flaw that could stop you from using the goggles altogether, this is something that nearly every single person I've talked to has experienced pretty early on in their ownership. In fact, it literally happened to me after a few days of use, and that's not what you want after spending $600. What I'm talking about here is the face foam, also known as the padding. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, you have to apply this foam yourself to the face shield and in all honesty, it just kinda sucks. The foam peels back and stops sticking for most people, others catch it on something and rip it off, but the end result for nearly everyone is to buy third party padding. I personally haven't done that myself yet, but it is certainly on the list of to-dos. Alright, now that you've got an understanding of what type of issues the goggles have got, you can probably also see that nearly everything is a fairly easy fix, and that brings me on to the third thing that I love about them. One of the massive selling points of HD Zero is the fact that they are open source. That means that any person and any company can in theory modify, change, or add things to these goggles, which holds a really interesting future. With more people tinkering away at software bugs, things can get fixed quicker, and with more companies hopefully jumping on board, we should start to see further hardware innovations as well. It basically creates the scenario where if something is a problem for you with these goggles, it's probably pretty likely that someone else has done something to solve it, or if you're a creator, I'm sure that you could design it up yourself too. I get it though, these things are not cheap, and for you to understand whether they're worth the price tag of $600, we need to weigh them up against the five essential factors mentioned earlier. Firstly, we already know that they nail the HD system part right on the head, but to take it a step further, it's actually worth noting that you can run the native HD Zero system, you can use analog with the additional module, and you can hook a walk snail VRX up to it as well. That literally makes these some of the most versatile goggles for every part of FPV. Just minus DJI, of course. We're also aware that our second factor of comfort is kind of a no-brainer, but it does have its issues with the foam padding, which takes a few brownie points off for me. Thirdly, we've got the factor of whether these are actually going to look good to you in terms of hardware and adjustability. Personally, my eyesight is about as clear as a transparent brick wall. That's the mean, it is absolutely terrible. So terrible in fact that I've actually struggled with the adjustable adapters in the past with DJI goggles too, so I didn't actually have too much hope for these goggles either. I was, however, totally blown away by how crystal clear the lenses are and how I was able to adjust them almost perfect for my vision. They don't fall short on the screen aspect either, boasting a pair of flagship 1080p 90Hz refresh rate OLED screens. I think it's safe to say that my eyes, of all people's eyes, don't need much more than that. I have to mention though, it is a bit risky to not provide the goggles with any form of lens cover, but again, this is just one of those things you can get 3D printed out, it just would have been nice for the price. The fourth factor is all about acceptance within the community, and I'm going to touch on that in just a moment, but first I've got to run through the wallet hurting factor. At $600, the price tag of these HD Zero goggles are certainly at the higher end of the spectrum, especially when we consider that you need to spend further money on them to get the antennas too. That means they're competing in the ring with giants like DJI and also high-end analog goggles like Orca. The VTXs and cameras are a similar story here too. If you're coming from analog, they're gonna feel pretty pricey. They're on about the same level as Walksnail, but a total breath of fresh air if you're a seasoned DJI pilot. At the end of the day, I'm fairly neutral on the price of everything from an outside perspective. It's not like it's budget friendly, but it also doesn't feel like overcharging for what's on offer either. Now, my confidence in talking about these goggles isn't just hot air. These were seriously one of the key players that got me to the NZO. For 50 days leading up to the race, my training was a balanced dance between analog and HD Zero. My DVR was working overtime recording hundreds of gigabytes. I spent hours watching live footage of my friends' flights, gradually allowing my trust in the goggles to grow until they basically became an extension of my flying. So skim through to the day of the National Drone Racing event and this is where the fourth essential factor really comes into play. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned the fourth factor is the importance of community adoption to stay relevant and have a promising future outlook ahead of them. Well, the Cena NZO was an absolute testament to this. Last year's event was dominated by analog loyalists with only a handful of pilots experimenting with HD Zero. This year, it was a different story altogether. HD Zero was not just present, it was literally a trend. Nearly half the pilots there, including big names like Thomas Bitmata, were sporting them. Now, I can't vouch for Thomas, but for me, these goggles were more than just a piece of equipment. As I explained in my last email newsletter, they actually helped me out in one massive way. 
As I sat there, goggles on, heart racing, I realized this was more than just a race to me now. This was the ultimate test of my last three months of hard work. My nerves were sky high and my hands were shaking as the starting buzzer went off blaring. I took off as quickly as possible, fully aware that this was one of my three chances to put my skills to work and try to actually win. These first couple of rounds though, not ideal, not ideal. What happened? Like yeah, well, I uh, crashed. <laughs> Let's just say they were more about me getting cozy with the ground rather than flying. But in the third round, there was a noticeable shift. I paused for a moment, took some deep breaths, and refocused myself. Looking through my goggles, I felt a sense of calm rush over my nerves. This gear had been a reliable companion during my practice sessions, provided a view that had become familiar and comforting, and so it was now time to trust in that familiarity. As the final round started, I had lagged behind initially, concentrating fully on my flight path and not thinking about anything else. And you know what? It paid off. I completed my first lap and soon I heard that two competitors had dropped out, meaning suddenly second place was within reach for me as long as I could make it through two more complete laps. It's all down to Brody Reed. The last man standing. It's his race to win. All the time know, it's the his world. race to come second. Oh. Yay! <laughs> That second place score took me from 35th all the way up to 20th place overall, which for my first ever national drone race, I don't think is too bad at all. Now look, although these goggles did play a massive part in helping me focus, without using a simulator prior to race day, I would have been absolute toast. So to make sure you know which simulator made all the difference, watch this video here next. See you soon.